Hi folks. Hopefully the um, audio should be a bit better now. The only issue is um, that the leads are a bit short. I'm rearranging the audio slowly but surely, trying to make it um, better. So I'm back to the lava mics because these are very good they tend to be good for hearing me rather than the fan um, whereas the general boom mic on the arm up here is a real sucker for picking up the fan noise uh, eventually what I'm going to do is move the boom mic over to this side here to that bench so when I'm working on that bench you know putting stuff together and things or testing then um, that mic will be useful over there because the level mic leads are not long enough for me to reach uh, if I move over there so that's the plan the other thing is the microphone when it's over on that side it will be further away from the uh, fan noise so hopefully it will be less of an issue anyhow I have my tea Wednesday night and we're streaming. It's like the earlier time of 7 pm because I need to finish by 9 tonight. Um, quite a bit going on at the moment, which we cover. Uh, let's get the old um, <coughs> list up first, this could be best. Mm. This one, this one, no, this one. Hold on. Uh, I've managed to put that there. Let me just copy this across, and I won't have to keep switching windows. Oh, these mic leads are now. Getting in the way. Mm -mm -mm. New scratch file. Here we go. Let's just put this in. Use that for a second. So that's what we're going to be um, covering. Uh, let me up the size of the font again. God, I've got to remember where this is. So complicated. Um, so behavior. No, it wasn't there. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, why do I find it so hard to find this? There's just um, in the uh, I'm looking at settings. You can't see them on the window. It doesn't show this window. But um, there are about three different places where you can set the um, set the font size. There's the editor font. There is the um, appearance and behavior theme font. And there is an additional one, which I think is part of the um, language. Um, settings. Let me just try see if it's this one. So we'll find out. That's not working. I'm obviously changing the wrong one here. Control front. I think so. No. Um asking code editing. Uh, there may be some frame drop off. I apologize, folks. Crazy, I can never find this damn thing. It's insane. No, I'm far too much. And what is most annoying about this editor is you can't just. Um, increase it you know using the command keys like you know control shift type thing is this it no it's definitely not that's the um ui font size we don't want to change that Scope, material icon settings, raw material theme settings, settings. Just a few project settings now. Just gotta go through these one by one, I think. Comes, comes from editor tabs, PX. Mm. 
is it smart fees code editing right let's just run it just change it Scheme. Color scheme font. We're making that large. No, it's not making any difference either. Not very strange. My word. Code style. I think config. This has really got me folks, I can't remember where it is. In its settings. Right, whilst, it's, whilst I'm doing that, let me just take this off because I'm quite warm. Hmm. Um, I'll come back to this in a sec. Um, My computer screen is not very bright. Not quite sure what you mean by that, Laura. Um, what's the audio like, Laurie? Is it good? Just whilst I mess with the um, settings here. Is fine. Thank you, Larry. Good. Use custom font. Send it. <laughs> no, that's the UI. Not the editor window. The trouble when everything's settable, it's difficult to. Um, is there a presentation mode? Preview only. Editing preview. Damn it, I have seen this so many times and I always have the same problem. It's nuts. So, let's see. Two. Two. Settings to that. Something somewhere overrides the font size. No. No. Editor. General. Don't. This is the one it should be. Some reason doesn't seem to do it. It's the logical one. Font size. And to have a colour scheme which also has its own uh, Colour scheme fonts. 
I'm going to change that. that. Neither of those seem to do anything. That's what's really weird. I'm changing the size, but it doesn't seem to increase. Use color theme font instead of default. Color scheme. Yeah, I don't think it is that console font maybe. As if I change that, uh, nothing. Okay. settings here. Okay, I think it's I am a bit flummoxed. I did find it last time. These font changes and make any difference. The preview does current editor font jet brains minus 16 defined in color scheme. Sorry, I noticed we're um, connecting and then disconnecting me again. What joy! Right, well, let's just. I could be doing this for ages. It's very strange that it does this, and I can't seem to change it. Um, it may be the, the the dimming of the screen may be down to the fact that I'm opening opening up a um, a settings dialog that you can't see, Nori. That may be dimming the main window in the background. That's probably what's going on. What I'm doing is I'm searching through the settings, trying to find where the font size is controlled. It's very strange. There is more than one place in which it's set, but um, it just seems completely impervious to my efforts to change it. And it's just really annoying that it doesn't um, Just found a setting. 
Oh, I wonder if this works. No. This kind of setting that let, lets me um, change it with a mouse wheel, <laughs> which I've enabled. And guess what? When I try and do that, change font size with control plus mouse wheel, which I've turned on, which is what I want. It's not working. So let me just, maybe it's because this color scheme is overriding use color scheme font instead of the default now let me try does this work do I need to have yee look at that would you Adam and Eve it I've cracked it folks yeah so right I think I know what's going on now Hopefully that should look bigger. Let me check the OBS window. That's a bit more readable, isn't it, folks? And I can change it now with the control and scroll wheels, which is better. What it is, is because there's a um, theme slash color scheme plugin that's been added, it can override the font settings and the appearance. But 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 it doesn't seem to do that perfectly the, the the two pieces the way that things are being set within the editor and the way that it's being set by the theme are not consistent so I've just turned the theme setting off for now and I've also enabled the default uh, control scroll so hopefully I can keep it like that and then I can do it like this which is marvelous so you can see now what we are planning to talk about today I do apologize for that delay the uh, stream may well go up and down at points I do apologize for that but it normally comes back um, so let's have a look what's on our list here um, I wanted to do some things before others I know Laurie you've got to go early today so let's cover the um, let's cover this one here this puppy so um, Q's pie is what I'm calling this so what are we talking about here um, if you remember the conversation we had on the last stream, which I think was, it was Friday, wasn't it? Not a Wednesday. Uh, so it actually wasn't that long ago. Um, between the uh, STM32 and the ICE are a number of connections. The main connection for communication is a quad SPI link. So that can send, um, in SDR mode, it can send a nibble for every clock cycle. In DDR mode, it can send a byte every clock cycle. And we can clock that SDR up to about 100, 108, I think, with the uh, F7. Um, or we can use the DDR method, which transfers a nibble on each clock edge, potentially. Uh, but that will only go up to about 80 megahertz. But that means you're doing 80 megabytes um, per second, which is fairly respectable. Now, there's other pins as well connected. We've got five other pins that are part of that. And Laurie and I have been working out how to best we, we, we started a conversation in the last stream how do we best get this communication working between the STM32 and the ICE40 in such a way that any peripherals inside the, ST, uh, inside the ICE40 that have been synthesized um, have a relatively low latency for communication um, the traditional way you use quad SPI by the way is it's normally used for connecting to things like memory like flash so normally on a transfer you'd send 
you know, one, two or three address bytes first. Tell it whether it's a read or write. You then may send some dummy bytes to allow the memory to get ready to write to that address or read from that address, depending, you know, what sort of memory you're accessing or whether it's flash or whether you're writing to flash, etc. And that's normally combined with commands. So it's quite inefficient if you're not using it in address mode. Yes, we could put all the peripherals on, say, a wishbone bus and have them numerically addressed like that and then map it into the memory map. But it's highly inefficient and the latencies involved are quite high because of the overhead of having to send the address, addresses, etc. So uh, Laurie and I kind of rubbed our or banged our heads together initially. Um, and we kind of, um, I had some ideas already, Laurie had some ideas, and we've kind of um, um, seemed to have a, a solution. Uh, Laurie's been doing most of the HDL work on, you know, on the ice side, trying to get the simulation up um, so we can take a look at that in a sec. So let's cover that stuff before we cover any of the other things, but just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, I've changed the microphones. I did mention earlier, I'm back on the level mics, which should be better, less fan noise. Let me know if that isn't the case. Um, I've also lowered the webcam just slightly because it was a bit too high. I just felt I was looking up or kind of down at the bottom looking up. So I've made a slight adjustment to that. So that's now a bit better as well. Um, I'm going to use the mic, as I mentioned at the start of the screen, the uh, boom mic, I, this one. I'm going to move that over here so I can use it when I'm working on the bench. It will also be further away from the fan then, which it seems to be particularly sensitive at picking up. So um, then I'll have the best of both worlds. Uh, switching between them isn't completely straightforward at this point, but I'll work it out. Um, Laurie says, I think the noise is about the same. Well, I'll see what happens. Um, so after I record this, I'll go and play it back and compare it to the older ones. I thought the last ones with the boom mic were actually worse than the ones with the lava microphones. Um, but your mileage may vary. Um, we can play around with this, hopefully get it improved. Um, Maybe the gain's too high. I could turn the gain down. I don't know what my um, audio level is. Maybe my audio level is very high. I could take it down a little bit. Let me know if you think that's the case. I'm surprised that Laurie thinks that the fan noise is about the same. Right, so that's that. A uh, bit of housekeeping. Um, Yeah, let's go to Q's Pi, and that's pronounced Q's, like that, and then Pi. That's what I'm calling this. It's basically QSPI plus events. So um, what Laurie and I have come up with is a way of doing this that we think is kind of uh, a good combination of the use of pins and the bandwidth we've got between the two devices. So we keep the quad SPI there and then we're avoiding using any of the byte transfers on the, Q on the quad SPI to be addressed like. So the way that the scheme works is we have another four pins which we are using to identify up to 15 different peripherals or events linked to peripherals. And we also have another line which indicates the direction that the events are traveling in because the events precede the transfers effectively. Um, and we, we can look at the um, uh, we can look at the HDL for that and we can look at um, some of the um, waveforms. And that's working in STR simulation at the moment. Um, the next stage 
uh, that Laurie's working on, and he's the one that's done most of the code for this, not me. I've just been kind of browsing with it and occasionally coming up with ideas uh, if he comes unstuck, etc. But um, it's mainly Laurie's work, which is really, really cool, and I really appreciate Laurie doing that. Um, the scheme works um, basically if the STM32 wants to send a packet to uh, a peripheral that's synthesized in the ice, it has to first check that there is no events being sent to it. It has to read the event lines and check the direction and make sure you know the state machine in terms of the way this works um, comes into play and it checks first to see if any of those are being set if they're not being set it thinks oh these are free it can then put an event ID on the event pins that identifies which event the packets are going to be destined for um, it then has to do another check to make sure it because effectively the event ID is really just in a request to send to that peripheral because what can happen is there may be something happening almost simultaneously but maybe fractionally later and the peripheral may need to send to the STM32 so it has to go through this kind of handshake um, but if it goes through that handshake it then moves on it then does the um, the send to the ICE 40 over quad SPR so it sends the packet the HDL sorry the the synthesized um, logic inside the ICE 40 then receives that and passes it on to the peripheral in question likewise when a peripheral inside the synthesized uh, logic inside the FPGA wants to you know maybe it's a UART or something I mean the UART's a bad example or an SPI or something it's received some things and it needs to send the packet back to the STM32 it can instigate um, a transfer packet to the STM32 but because the STM32 is a master of the QSPI bus because the QSPI bus is not duplex it's only half duplex um, the uh, dispatcher on the ice side basically also goes through a handshake where it says this is the ID of the, um, the the peripheral the event ID that we want to send to you and then the STM instigates um, a read of that packet of a QSPI um, so there's quite a bit of handshaking stuff that goes on in between um, and the direction line is controlled by the ice side by the synthesized um, state logic the dispatcher and then the event lines themselves are actually bi-directional and they are pulled up so that they always read F um, nibble F if um, nothing is driving them that's quite an important part of the protocol because uh, F or all pins one is basically also a sign but also can be used as a symbol from the ice to say the FIFO is full do not send it can also act as the intermediate point when the uh, handshake goes on prior to any communications either way it's critical to it so let's have a look at that um, what should we do first Laurie shall we show the uh, HTL or shall we look at the waveform I think we should show the dispatcher um, first just have a quick talk through that maybe because it's nice and well documented well, he's done a great job here so um, the solution um, I say the solution the candidate at this point it's only running in simulation we don't have it running on Arbor yet um, 
is being written in um, Enmigen, which is nice. So, um, what oh, does this control scroll? Yes, it's quite interesting because it's it changes per file. How cool is that? So let's get that out. Is that a good size, folks? Can you read that? I just pause a bit whilst you um, have a look. What do you think, Laurie? Font size okay? Oh, some frame drop, I'm afraid. I think that size is reasonable. It looks readable from here, but I just want to wait for a confirmation. Squeeze it up a bit so we can see more. Sorry, drop out. I should be back now. Um, is that okay visually? That font size for everyone, Laurie. Right, I will assume so. So, um, just ignoring the QSBI implementation at this point, let's just look at the dispatcher so we can see what's going on here. Um, so first, side, first um, on the constructor of this dispatcher, we have a packet size of 16. The reason that this is being chosen, by the way, that means 16 bytes are transferred with each packet. That is the quanta of information that's transferred every time there's a handshake. Uh, the reason for choosing 16 bytes is, I believe on the STM32, certainly on the, I think it's the F7s, and probably the H7s as well, if you want to use DMA, and we certainly want to use DMA because we don't want to be stealing away processor cycles um, for sending all of this information, then the DMA size or the maximum we can DMA, I think, in each chunk is um, 16 bytes. So that's why I've chosen that number. We may have to adjust that in practice, but we need a number to start with. And the number of peripherals actually naming wise instead of peripherals that could be called events but let's not complicate it here um, so we're saying 15 now the reason that there's 15 events is we have four bits of information to convey four pins which gives us a maximum of 16 different identities from 0 through to 15 um, given that one of those is the uh, swap around or the full do not send then um, we lose one of the 16 and we're down to 15. okay so we're just setting up the connections here so if you've used um, quad spi before you'll be familiar it's a bit like spi there's a chip select which is a negative chip select that's what the n stands for on there so it's active low there is a clock which is used to time the uh, exchange or the sampling of the data um, and then normally on the outside we're actually inside here we have an array of four pins to convey the uh, nibble um, and here We've got QDI and QDO. 
the reason this is split in two is because we get, we have an input mode and an output mode. Remember I said it's half duplex quad SPI. So those four pins have to be turned around depending whether it's a read or write communication with respect to the um, STM32. Now the indication here, the I is respect in, is from the respect of the ICE 40 and the out is from the respect of the uh, ICE 40. So uh, we're, we, the STM32 will write to this input signal or we'll read the signal from the STM32 on these and then when we want to send stuff back to the STM32 it will go on those. Um, here is that important direction uh, control and this enables the events to sim symbolically indicate which direction the event is coming from or going to. Um, it's an important here although this will be default reset zero it's good to emphasize this so you know from a state point of view where this is beginning uh, the default is reset equals naught funny enough but you forget uh, and the reason that Laurie's put that in there is because I asked the same question because I forgot Laurie writes a lot more uh, M Mijan than I do so he would have been aware of that um, then we've got our event um, again because this is a bi-directional port on the outside from the point of view here we have um, the event in um, that's with respect from the ice point of view so in other words what's being sent from the STM side my uh, STM um, initiated transfer and then out will be an ice 40 initiated transfer where we're set where we're sell, telling it what peripheral the next packet is coming from um, oh and it's working out the bits from that number of peripherals that number of peripherals 15 so that will return four I presume it returns four um, bits for in other words how many bits would you need to represent this numerical value there's a whole load of convenience functions in um, mmijim a lot of which I'm not familiar with that um, thank goodness um, um, Laurie is I, I found a few of those when I was looking through this uh, mmijim over the last couple of days actually but peripherals so in this case um, what um, Laurie's doing is he's setting up um, something to contain all of the numerated peripherals and then he's setting up uh, RX peripheral. This is the RX um, the RX data from the peripheral itself to the dispatcher and the TX from the peripheral to the dispatcher. And again, there has to be the same number as there are peripherals. Uh, and he also initializes these to zero, by the way. Very important. Because we all need to check that. Because there's no point um, checking if a peripheral hasn't been initial, initialized to something. So if it's none, we can safely ignore it. So even though we've, uh, we've got 15 slots here for peripherals, we, we may only be using one or two. And there's no point spending time checking on peripherals that don't exist. And none is a very Python-esque way of doing that. Um, register a peripheral with a sp specified ID. What's the saying? Uh, I support peripherals that only receive or only send. Ah, nice subtlety that I missed there. Um, he's he's saying that you can have peripherals that are one-way streets, i.e., peripherals that only receive or only send. I'm not sure of a good example I suppose you could think of something like a display maybe is something that you might only send to although not not, not all displays are like that RX peripherals are ones that can receive so that would be like a really dim display that you can't read the frame buffer of for example I presume or a monitor or a logger 
TX peripherals are the ones that just send. I may have TX and RX ran the wrong way in my description. This is from the dispatcher's point of view or from the peripherals point of view. <laughs> oh, don't you just hate that bit? Anyhow, so you can have these peripherals that don't necessarily need to send and receive. They may only do one of those. And that's why uh, Laurie has structured it in this manner. Um, register a peripheral with a specified ID. This is like the event ID. And say wherever it receives or sends data or both. Um, so I presumably is the ID. Um, mod is the module i.e. the peripheral itself rx and tx are presumably booleans right uh, python booleans and it just sets up the peripheral array and it adds that in i.e. stops it being none and it sets whether it's uh, you know it does so on RX and TX so it knows whether it's RX or TX very good right um, elaborate 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 in my if you if you're not already familiar with, is the way that it basically um, builds the HDL that it's going to output um, you always start off with a module um, so what do we have here? We have signals. We have a TX packet and an RX packet. Both are dimensioned to the same size. Um, here we're saying self dot packet size. Remember, packet size was set up to be 60. So we're saying eight lots, eight packets effectively. No. We're saying 16 times 8 bit. Am I correct? Laurie, that's 16 times 8 bit. That's what the 8's for there, isn't it? 16 bytes or packet size times the bytes. 127, right? I think. Yeah, 128, so yeah, 0 to 127. Bytes. Is that? No. 127. Is it 127? Hmm. So this is like a bit of memory. Um, I'll come back to that. I think it's 127 bytes. No, 127 bits. Am I right? Each one of those, Laurie. Uh, we've got RX valid signal, which is a one bit signal, which is used to communicate um, or handshake. Um, and RX peripheral event signal, which is that four bit signal from, is that from the peripheral? The event ID for both directions. 128 bits, yes, thank you. That's what the H for. It's the number of bits times the number of packets. So yeah, it's a bit of memory to hold uh, the uh, receive and transmit packets. Right, QSP send and receive module. So we add those sub modules in, the transmission module and the RX module. Um, QSPIs. We um, add the registered peripheral. So we're now going to um, basically enumerate the peripherals. So P will enumerate however many peripherals there are. Um, and assuming that it's not none, i.e. it's not it's not empty, then it adds that to our, as a to our submodules. Um, Connect the QSPI modules. So here we're doing some combinational logic. 
um, so for the TX side, we have the um, chip select, the active low chip select, and we're connecting that with the internal signal of chip select active low. Uh, the same for the external clock and the TX clock. Sorry, the clock and the, yeah, the external clock. And we're also connecting the TX packet to the TX packet memory, isn't it? TX packet, TX packet, oh, it's TX packet. Yes, the memory there. And um, the QD underscore output, we are reading from TX QD and the RX CSN from the internal CSN, sorry, the external CSN. Oh, this is basically just wiring at this point, um, clock to clock, and the QD. QD, by the way, is, is, is short for the, um, the data. So um, we're just connecting all the relative bits and bobs up from the internal signals to the external signals. Um, set valid, selected RX peripheral and set the input packet. So we're going to go through the um, number of peripherals. So this will be 15 potentially. Um, and if this isn't, if this particular peripheral is not zero, or sorry, not none, I, it's a, it is a peripheral. We are going to um, a receiving peripheral. We are going to put some combinational logic, some connections in. Basically, the uh, peripheral I valid signal, input valid signal. We're connecting that to the AND of the RX valid signal, and the truth of the boolean of perif underscore ev equal to i so in other words if the event is bound for us um, then basically this i valid signal will take um, if the event is for us and the rx is valid that that will be um, true and then the i the, the peripheral my packet is equal to the receive packet. It's just a direct, um, you know, in Verilog, that's just the same as a, as an equals and a sign, if you like. Um, we can have a look at the acknowledge when it's so set acknowledge to default for all the TX peripherals. Okay, so we're sending the, the peripheral input acknowledge signals to zero so we're just scanning for all of them any that are legitimate uh, TX peripherals um, then we've got a state machine so this is uh, the way that um, it's quite nice the way that uh, MIGEM allows you to build state machines it uses this kind of built-in DSM basically with M FSM is the top holder of this state machine um in terms of the states we've got um the default state and the begin state is what's called the idle state um and there's some notes here in the idle state the stm32 can write to the event pins uh, we are waiting for data to be sent from the stm32 or a peripheral to have output data to send to the stm32 so it's that's why it's idle it's not doing anything at this point or it may be in between packets so to speak um, so when we're in this state um, what we have to do is if the STM32 sets an event um, we need to process the incoming data so here what we're saying is if um, If the code isn't F, i.e. all pins um, 
pulled up that means we have a signal because remember when I said all the event pins are pulled up so if if we're inputting from those and we read F that means those pins aren't being driven they're just pulled up um, but because we're uh, inverting that we're saying when that is not the case when they're not all pulled up that means there's a legitimate event that the STM um, 32 has actually set an event ID on those pins so at this point what we do is we do some synchronous logic uh, and what we do is we say the peripheral uh, peripheral event um, will be set you know because it's synchronous on the next clock cycle to whatever that is okay whatever that input is from the STM32 it's going to read those pins um, and then we're going to move to the next state which is STM event because it's determined that the STM has initiated an event at this point if that's not the case in other words if the pins are all pulled up and the STM is not placing an event signal then um, it's going to check on the peripherals so it's going to scan through them to see if any of them are ready to send so the way it does this is it it takes the um, takes all the peripherals and it iterates through them that's what the for loop is here um, it looks at the TX uh, and if it is a TX able peripheral um, it will look at the valid signal to see if you know if there's an output valid signal from the from the peripheral it knows that there's something ready to be transmitted up to the STM32 um, I'm not sure why we have this first thing here um, basically there is a different precedent set at the start the very first time it does this versus later but anyhow if there is something there uh, it grabs it and it says moves on to the next state which is a peripheral event so in other words a peripheral is trying to send something to the STM32 um, so we were either going to uh, STM event if STM was trying to send it or we're going to the peripheral event here if we go to the STM event basically um, what it's going to do is going to wait for the um, chip select signal to go low um, then it knows on the next cycle clock cycle it can start reading that packet um, because the, S the STM32 is going to start writing um, so with the when it's in the receiving state um, whilst CSN if 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 we're ending the transaction I CSN would be high so this would be true then we know we're ready to have received all of the um, nibbles of the packet and we need to notify the peripheral that these are aimed for so we're going to um, set the valid pin and we're going to um, receive the packet and put it into the packet buffer that for that RX and we're going to move on to the receive handshake so what's going to happen now is we're going to have the conversation with the peripheral and make sure that it actually receives um, receives that packet that we've just taken off the QSPI bus so on this clock cycle when we've moved to receive handshake then um, basically we're checking if it's ready and we go through all the peripherals to find the one that matches the event ID that we received and then we do a synchronous um, 
uh, Rx valid to zero and then allowing the proof to pick it up the end of that is that the end? Is that the acknowledgement? I'm trying to remember now. Peripheral event, peripheral handshake, peripheral event. Oh, I've gone, to, you know, receive handshake, yeah. And then we return back to the uh, idle state, so we can then repeat. It can be another STM transmission or uh, a peripheral that needs to send. Um, how are you doing for time, Laurie? I know you wanted to get away, mate. Um, the other one is when a peripheral sending, so as it says here, let me just read these comments because these are important. In peripheral event state, we check for the race condition where both sides are trying to send data at the same time. This is important, it took us a while to work this out. The STM32 detects this and does the read instead, but we must wait for the event lines to be pulled up when the STM32 sets input mode. We can then go into send mode. Um, send mode is from the ISIS perspective or from the peripherals perspective. We need to first copy the data from the peripheral and sorry, peripheral to the packet buffer and acknowledge. Also, before going into send mode, we set the direction from the ISIS 4 to the STM32 and set the event lines to the ID step to peripheral. So at this point, we're signaling we get what we want to do is we want to. Avoid the race condition first um, to make sure that we don't overlap with the STM itself trying to send. And there's a series of state steps to prevent us from doing that. Then what we do is we tell it which peripheral ID this is coming from. So we set the event lines and we change the direction line to indicate to the STM32 that it, ne it needs to go and do a basically do a read from us because we've got stuff waiting for it. On the STM, STM32 side, there's going to be an interrupt on that uh, direction line that's going to be kicked off, which will then read the event um, ID from those pins and decide where it's going to, what it's going to do with that data once it's read it. Um, so if we have a quick look at this then, so with M-State peripheral event, so we're in the peripheral event. With M. If self.ev equals all, so in other words, if they're all pulled up, I, they're not being set, then we can proceed because we don't want to set those pins if they're already being received. So we're checking that the STM hasn't just suddenly decided to try and send something to us. Um, we have M switch peripheral EV. So we're now going to a decision depend on, we're, we're building um, a switch case, like a case statement based on the peripheral IDs. Um, um, the, so we're going through the number of peripherals and obviously if they're none, we don't bother putting a case in for them, but for the case of the peripherals. So for all the peripherals here, we're building up a case statement, um, which is like a MUX effectively uh, inside the HDL. This gets turned into a MUX and then synchronously so if it's this particular peripheral's case, i.e. the event corresponds to its ID, then what it will do is the TX pack packet will be set from the TX peripheral uh, I part of the packet, the output packet that we've, um, that, that we've taken from the peripheral itself. And we are going to do a one cycle uh, acknowledgement basically to confirm that we're reading from that um, that 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 data um, and then there's another sync bit at the end which basically um, what does this do right yeah so this sets the um, direction on the event lines and it sets the ID I from where this which peripheral this is coming from and then its next stage is it goes to the send um, so basically here it's just waiting for the um, QSPI read coming from the STM32 um, so it's looking for the CS line going low and then it's actually receiving the information now it's going to wait for that uh, chip select line to go high to know that the transactions ended and then it's going to return itself 
to um, the idle state or the other thing it does is it sets the direction back the other way because um, it needs to it needs to be in that state ready for the next transaction and that's it I know it's fairly complicated and it did take quite a long time to get here and we, we had to deal with a couple of race conditions but that's just the way of something like this but it's quite an efficient protocol um, we'll have to think about where we start putting some of this code as well um, Laurie so that people can take a take a look at it um, at the moment what what's the URL can you just post the URL Laurie of your your um, so I, one minute, I'm going to have it here git uh, does it tell me your property no that's not good info exclude no commit directory ah there you go thank you Laurie so if you want to go and dip into the code and look at it and at your leisure then please do um, but it's quite a bit of work now obviously what you're not seeing going on is the synthesis the code sorry the HDL for the actual QSBI transaction itself ie the bit banging if you like of the QSBI signal um, one thing I will show you briefly if I can is what this looks like here um, before we move on to the next thing wave. Let's see if I can open this open tab. Uh, hmm. Okay. Can I multiple select here? I think I can. No, same state, knowledge, valid, valid, valid. I'm just selecting the relevant signal so that we can have a little poke around and a look at the transactions. Probably not in the right order. Hey ho. Let me see if I can bring this to the foreground. Bear with me, folks. Uh, which, good. GTK, GTK. Here we go. So here we can see the, um, the signal. It may be tricky to read. Um, one of the problems with GTK Wave, particularly on this screen, is it produces rather small height lines. And you can't exactly, you know, change the size of the window or anything. Because if I make this window bigger, the actual lines themselves stay check size. There is a way of formatting these lines. You can add, I believe, a um, like a um, formatting file that I'm not an expert on using. Um, so. Let's give you the highlights. So at the top here is the internal ice clock. That's a synchronous clock that's been used to do the um, the logic. 
Um, the next line down you see is the CSN line, the chip select line. So when that's high, that means nothing's being transferred. When it's low, that means a QSPI transfer um, is in progress from the STM32. So we see here that there are actually two QSM, um, QSPI transfers or QSPI transfers to use our, our bust. So um, the first thing you see here, so if we look at this line here, um, what we can see, these are the event signals, input and then output. And you can see that actually changing. You can see the input event changing from zero to F here. Um, the, these are the internal signals. But most important is this one, which is the FSM state. I don't think there's any way of making this bigger. It's really annoyingly small. Um, so here is the state machine and you can actually see what's going on here. It's saying um, STM and even if I zoom in, I don't think that's necessarily going to help. So if we're looking at a receive pattern, we start off in the idle state then we go to STM event and then we go to receiving before going back to the idle state here so this from from this end to this end is a receive um, receive being from the ice perspective uh, which means it's the stm32 sending um, a packet to or yeah sending at least one packet to the ice 40 um, If we look down here at the input data from the quad SPI data bus, we see numerically what's being sent here. The value zero is being sent first, one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way up to F. And then that same thing is being repeated. So we literally um, have um, 16 no we have 32 nibbles of data because if you remember um, I said at the beginning we're working on a single data rate so here if we look at the start of this um, QSBI transfer if we look at the clock it's happening on one edge yeah, and the same edge is the next data, then the next edge, etc. etc. So we're only doing it on the single edge, single data rate. So it's a nibble a time. Each one of these represents a nibble. That's why we've got 32 nibbles. Now, 32 nibbles is the same as 16 bytes. Okay. And what we can also see here is um, because it realizes here that it's in receive mode, it can actually start latching in um, that information. So at the end of the transaction, what we look at, because this is the start of the transaction here on this edge, the end of the transaction, the QSBI transaction is here. And what we see is when that transaction is coming to an end what happens is we see on the next clock cycle here we see this event which is i valid input valid that is then followed by a state change back to um from receiving to let's just zoom in if we can To receive a uh, handshake and here we can see the uh, input valid signal and then it moves 
what happens wait a minute is that then transferred to the input packet i27 no one two three four yeah so we on on when on this clock cycle that is also fed into the input packet which is 127 bits wide and we see the 0, 1, 2, all the way up to F and then 0 up to F again. Uh, meanwhile, the state machines returned to idle here. And then the peripheral um, event ID goes back to pull ups. Is that correct? Is it going back to pull-ups at this point? Am I looking at the right peripheral EV? Oh, sorry, that was peripheral EV in that case was zero. Because then we're actually going into the next event, which is a peripheral trying to send the other way. I do apologize. So at this point here we've gone from idle again because the peripheral wants to send don't forget this is all in simulation as well this isn't actually happening this is just a simulation that's been written that Laurie wrote to excite the HDL simulation so here we're getting a peripheral event and it's peripheral one with an ID of one and after one clock cycle what happens here is it on the event output lines we take that one because that's the idea of the peripheral and we, that is presented to the um, event output lines um, because it's checked that they are not um, not being driven by the STM32 they're pulled up at this point can you see that um can we see the event pins yeah, i don't know if we can but event out q3 is it this one i want it zero hmm. not sure about that um and then it moves into the send state and at this point this is the information the i packet that we want to send so it then commences um, it moves um, to send we should see the qdir change here yeah it changes direction indicate to the stm32 event is on the event uh, lines and the direction is about to change because you need to go and do a read and then on the not next clock cycle uh, we see the uh, CS line being pulled down here and that and we're moving into the send state here send is really from the ice point of view by the way I know it's confusing but what's happening now is a read transaction is occurring over QSPI so the CS is being pulled low and uh, let's, sorry, let's here, let's just um, zoom out a bit, there we go. And then we move into sending where we are actually transmitting these bytes. So the first one here is zero, then one, then two, three, four, etc. So if I just zoom out a bit more, we're actually sending up to F and then we're repeating it. So we're, we're sending the same data back effectively. And that's the transaction. I just wish I could find a way of making this a bit more easy to read. Um, maybe iPost's got some clues on that. I'll have to ask him at some point. He, he uses these in his um, um, videos and I'm sure they look a bit bigger. In his. He may even color code them as well. Anyhow, so from a simulation point of view, it looks good. And we are happy. The, um, I'm probably going to move on there. How are you doing, Laurie, for time? Because I know you've got to dip out at some point. Are you still okay? Or are you, um, 
departing. I'll just do a time check. It's 8.23. I've got about another just under 40 minutes left to cover some of the other bits and bobs. Mm, it's a real shame I can't zoom in on the size of this. Date format, mm, color format, sharp. alias height trace, what's that? Highlight trace only. Yeah, there's no easy way of just changing the um, insert analog height. No, it's not going to help us. Color format, date data format no, I can't change the um, size easily on that if anyone knows how to do that let me know I'm fascinated I know there are things you can do but it might be via a, some sort of format file not got an answer from Laurie so he may well be off so that's where we are on that uh, the next step Laurie is going to actually try and get that running on a um, the easiest thing to get it running on is not the uh, Black Eyes MX, unfortunately, because we need a whole bunch of lines connected to the STM32. Um, so he's going to use one of the older Black Eyes 2s, um, which had loads of extra pins connected between the STM32 and the um, and the ice. So he's going to see if we can get that to the next level and we can start. Um, seeing what it looks like on the hardware okay so um that's that stuff what's next on our list let's just go back so let's get rid of this let's go back to here um so we've done a refresh we've done a not a refresh but a uh, basic overview um of that of the implementation right well, it's implementation slash sim in fact next okay so we've done that we're not covering the stm side we'll do that another day there was a discussion from a follow-up that we needed to do from um, last time but it's only worth doing that if there's people to discuss if we you want to talk about the DFU stuff from last time uh, let me know in the stream chat and we could actually cover that otherwise I'll just put that off until um, next week um, Cover these, I think. So let's just tick off all the ones that we've done. Um, talk about that probably next week. Um, multi USB tile. I've got a couple of tiles I've got to design. I've got everything listed on there. I'm not going to do these today because that would take too long. I should cover the mezzanine power control migrations. So just as a quick refresh then, uh, switching over to the hardware, given that no one's requesting DFU stuff, we'll do that next time maybe. Um, let me open up um, the CAD. There's some minor changes on the um, logic deck itself. Schematic. Um, let's just go straight to the PCB layer. Oh, that 
just confused it. So if we look at the layout here, um, just ignore the stuff on the right hand side. That's just going to confuse you. Um, I've made a small change here. We've removed the display FPC connector from the underneath because that wasn't going to be practical. Um, that just sits on the mezzanine now. It also means we don't have to duplicate components. The other thing we've got here is this connector at the top. Um, we've got a, that is the minus V for the um, higher power uh, rail. And then these two left and right are individual power sections that power either the left side of the tiles or the right side tiles. Um, so I've changed the mezzanine just slightly there. So I've got two effective power zones, one for the left, one for the right. Um, that is to support not only this board, but the another board that will come along next year as well. And we needed that flexibility. The LED is still kind of here, but it's smaller. And I've moved the, um, the um, resistor array for driving that underneath. Apart from that, not much else has changed on here. I have refined the signals that we're sending up to the mezzanine board, and that's what I want to talk about now. The other thing I've done is I've removed the um, USB power delivery um, chip from here, because that's going on the mezzanine now. Um, and you'll see why in a second. Um, I did add the DFU button finally. I know I, we talked about that before. Um, but you need that initially for programming the uh, STM if you don't have a um, JTAG or SWD um, device. Um, signals we're sending up to the um, mezzanine have changed slightly. We're sending up the debug signals for the STM32 as we were before. We're sending up the 5 volt signal on ground on this side. We're sending up two I2C buses that are reused inside here. One from the quick connector uh, and one from the um, tiles themselves. These are driven by the STM32. The other thing that we're sending up is two I.O. signals, which can be used as interrupts for the I squared C. And we also have the done and um, tile slash FPGA reset signals. We're taking those up because they're quite useful. Um, we also have the reset for the STM32, but that's part of the debug. And that's all of the signals that we're sending up. So it's just some minor changes really on that. This is more or less done now. I've got some um, some power uh, routing to complete on here, but uh, I'm, I'm happy with the signals now. So that's that's pretty much done. Uh, the other thing that we take up is the TX and RX to the mezzanine as well, in case we need to reuse that. So let's switch over now to the mezzanine because this is where the changes have come in. Um, so the mezzanine sits in the center in between the tiles at the same level. Um, I've had to move the JTEG connectors um, up a little because I've added this section at the bottom which I'm going to refer to in a minute. Everything else here is the same. You've got a display connector. You've got the slot through which to display connect, like the FPC connector. Um, no changes on this end with the I.O. connections. The terminals are now split um, for the zone. So there's two terminal connectors, screw terminals, for connecting to the power zones for the tiles. And there's the central post, um, the minus V that's shared for those power zones. Um, then the big difference comes at the bottom here. So forgetting the uh, JTAG SWD connectors that are here that we covered last time. I know I've moved them around, but they're the same connectors. Here we now have two um, USB power delivery um, chips and they're associated passives, etc. 
um, and we have two USB-C connectors on here and a couple of LEDs to indicate power. Now the point being here is we can do two lots of power delivery, uh, one for each zone. So theoretically, um, with these chips I can only go to 60 watts uh, power for each for each of the USB power deliveries. So that's 120 watts. However, if I update the chips, I can actually get them to 100 watts each, which will take us to 200 watts over USB from two USB-C provisions. So that's kind of neat. Um, and as I say, having the zone control from the left tile to the right tile is kind of a nice, nice way of doing things. It also enables us to double up the power, you know, per tile. So that's the change there. There are some, some big changes on the mezzanine board um, with some small changes on the um, on the logic deck itself. So those are the hardware changes. I'm trying desperately to get these nailed down because I want to order the boards. I need to get the mezzanine finished because I need to order the mezzanine boards when I order, order the logic decks as well as a few um tiles for testing as well uh, my deadline for that is this week so I, I really need to get that done in order to, uh, but that's where we are then so i thought i'd give a quick update so let's just go back to our list So meanwhile, back at the ranch, here we are. Um, so I've covered that, the power migration and the changes. Just wanted to keep everybody abreast of that. How are we doing for time? 25 to 2. We've got a bit, a bit of time here. Um, let me just do this one briefly, because this is quite important. So my plan is to build a number of test units that's why i want to get the pcb design off this week um, i'm making several at least three maybe four um test 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 kits which will consist of the um, logic deck itself and a mezzanine card there may be a couple of tiles as well. I'm still deciding what what's going to be in that test kit. Um, I'm going to have one. Laurie's going to have one because he's helping help writing the HCL and stuff, and he will need one to try the stuff out on. Um, Sylvan has helped me do the IOs. Uh, that's uh, at TNT um, on Twitter or on um, Discord. Um, he's helped me out a lot with the IOs. Um, in particular, working on the um, optimizing the communication and operation of the hyper flash. Sorry, the hyper RAM. Um, I'll also need to get the hyper flash done as well. And he can probably help on that. So he's going to get one as well, and he can start um, cracking on that and get that stuff um, operational. Uh, and optimize for the HX, the ICE HX, because um, it's currently only optimized for the ultras. So he's agreed to um, get that sorted. He gave me lots of advice how to best optimize the pinouts so that he can do that. So he's going to get one as well. If someone else wants to put some work in, I'm talking about here, it is work um, because what we're trying to do is get stuff up and running and test it. So we're really, if you're interested in helping with some testing and can do um, some work, then um, let me know and I might be able to get one more board um, and get it out if you think you can contribute um, in this area. And in terms of stuff we've got on there, we've got a camera on there, we've got a SPI LCD 
connector as well. Uh, so it's camera connector and LCD connector. Uh, and one of those is on the mezzanine, in fact. We've got with the normal P mod type connectors um, for, you know, if you've got existing P mods. Um, so you can still use some of those if you prefer to use some of those instead of things like the camera or LCD. And then we've got all the new tile stuff. Uh, in terms of what we're going to do, probably I've, I've got, as I mentioned on the notes here, you can see one of the things I've got on the list is a multi USB host slash OTG tile. Um, so I should probably open that up and give you a look at that because even though it's not done yet, I need to do that. I'll probably do this on a stream, but not this one. Let me get that open and show you. I'm not there yet because um, I'm trying to decide what connectors to put on. So let me just turn this on. So this is the uh, multi USB host. So the idea here, ideally, I want to use two A host connectors. Um, these are quite large though. And that's what my problem is here because I also want a device one or OTG one that can be device or host. Um, I can't fit two of the A type host ones in and a USB C, but I can fit in uh, one of the micro USB ones. So that's kind of what I'm looking at at the moment. I mean, I could go with free USB C's, but it's just not convenient. You know, these host ones are really useful for plugging in the following PS2 stuff, so the old stuff, because we can support the old PST, PS2 U, USB modes, you know, with those um, tiny adapters, you know, the green adapters or the purple adapters. So if you want to use PS2 keyboards on that, you can use that as well. Um, they're also good for like the gaming controllers, USB gaming controllers, and or any of the gaming controllers had the old PS2 modes. Um, or you can just simply use them as, you know, um, simple uh, USB type host devices, which we are seeing some uh, gateware emerge that we may be able to use for that. And then the device one can be used for any number of different reasons. So it could be used upstream to talk to, say, a serial port if we wanted to, or DFU direct into the FPGA. I know that's something that Salvam would like um, because his um, SOCs tend to use a DFU USB as their means of uh, updating. Um, you could use it as some other kind of like an audio device as well. That's another possibility. The only other alternative is we use like free USBs, it's USB C's, because that would fit in. But how convenient is it to have a USB C? You'd still need to convert that to a host type socket. Um, so I'm tempted to go with basically that. But anyhow, let me know your thoughts um, and I'll get this done pronto. Maybe we can do it on the um, stream next week. Okay. So I won't tick that off our list just yet. Um, let me just get rid of this. So back to the list. I'm not going to tick this off because we haven't done it yet. I'm just mentioning that's on the list for us to do, and I can do that on the stream. Um, we, I have currently designed a motor tile. This is a problem area because it's really difficult to get hold of the motor driver chips right now. Um, the ones that I've designed for, I can no longer get. Surprise, surprise. 
I can get them in a different package, but I already changed from that older package back to this package, and I don't want to change it again. But I've got a bigger problem anyhow in that these motor drivers that I was planning on using will only go up to 16 volts. Given that we've now added in power delivery, that goes up to 20 volts. And I'm thinking, hmm, do I really want to have tiles that are only 16 volts on a you know power bus that through software alone could switch up to 20. I can see you know some magic smoke appearing if I go down that route. So I've re-looked again and I think I have found the chips I want to use subject to me getting hold of some. Now at the moment they are pretty much like um, proverbial rocking horse shit but I think I can get a few for now and then next year I'll probably be able to get a lot more. Um, and it's a much more powerful, higher current drive, a much wider range of voltage. I think it goes up to 30 odd volts, maybe 40, I can't remember. But anyhow, like well above the 20 volt power delivery that we're, we're expecting to su support, you know, out of the box. Um, so I've got to redesign that. OK, um, but we can do that again. That doesn't have to be done now. That can be done, you know. On another stream, excuse me, I've got to get some lubrication. Hydration, sorry. Um, I haven't been drinking enough of this. So that's why I've noted there that the motor tile redesign uh, on that list. But again, we'll tick that off when we do that. I think I've covered all my bases now. Are there any questions? The DFU button conversation, by the way, is we've got two potential USBs on the Logic Deck, one of which we could use for serial, one of which we could use for DFU, or we could have one USB that switches between the two. Because we've now got a DFU button, we could, for example, if we're up and running, if you press that DFU button, it goes into DFU mode. And this is a common way of doing it, I've seen with um, the FPGAs that are using DFU. So what I'm talking about here is not programming the STM32 necessarily. This is how do we get you know the data that's going to be stored in the potentially in the STM32 external flash but also copied into or written to the hyper flash now the only, only way we can get stuff to the hyper flash is via the FPGA because the FPGA is the only thing that can connect to the hyper flash it's connected to the FPGA itself it's not connected to the STM32 but given a a standard uh, image um, that we can write for the ICE, ICE 40. Basically, the STM32 can load that image into the ICE 40, and then part of that image will be a Q's Pi to Hyperflash. And we could use DFU to talk to that basically so dfu mode we press the button go into dfu mode what happens is the stm32 then uh, loads the uh, ice 40 with the um, hyper flash the memory controller and we can then talk we can then copy the dfu uh, contents into the local spi flash on the stm32 sorry the external spm flash or we can send it directly to the hyperflash over the bridge. So that it does sound a little complicated, I and mean, there are some hoops there, but it will mean that not only can we program the STM32, we can program its external um, flash. We can also put default it user images for the IS40 on there, as well as a programmable image that enables us to program the hyperflash that's connected to the IS40. So we can pre-flash. The hyper flash that's connected to the nice 40. That's that's what that's about using a DFU protocol. 
Um, and the reason why we might want to do that on the same USB connector is because um, it takes up slightly less bandwidth. It also means you only have to plug one in. So there's a conversation to be had there of whether that's separate on two USBs, whether it's running all the time or you switch between serial and DFU, or whether serial's running all the time and DFU only runs when you press the DFU button, mode button, etc. etc. So there's a conversation to be had there. There is some gory implementa implementation details as well. I've found some good sources for a DFU library that I can add into Black Crab. Currently, it's for writing to internal flash in the STM32. But I think I can modify that so we can either write to an external SPI connected flash or over QSPI E, or sorry, QSPI um, into the hyperflash. So that's where we are. I think I've covered all my bases. I'm slightly early. I can't see any questions. So I'm probably going to call it for this stream. Uh, my plan is to do another stream next Wednesday. Um, I'm not sure what time that would be. It might be 7, maybe 8. But I will let you, you know on Discord. Um, please do come and join us down on Discord. I think I've provided uh, a link before. Um, let me give you one just in case. Hold on. Um, Here is a Discord link, um, so you can come and find us down on Discord, and we can continue these conversations. So everyone have a safe week, have fun, hack some stuff, write some code, build some hardware, design something. I will see you all, folks, uh, next Wednesday. Ciao.